jumping in, you know, we thought, hey, well, we're actually, since we're talking about the future, why are you when you were when you were a kid? Like whether it's an entertaining experience, could be TV, it could be video games, it could be places and spaces, but really encourage everybody to kind of get in your DeLorean or phone box or a time travel machine of sorts and uh, think about those things that really inspired, you know, creativity, culture, and connection. And when you, when you bring up the idea of the past, I often, when I'm talking to people at South By or any other place in the world, and they say, like, you have this crazy job and you're a futurist, what even is that job? And often I say, well, it's actually much easier and much simpler than you might imagine, because anybody that actually is sort of good, what you're just doing is studying things that have happened already and extrapolating them into where things are going. So when people think you're making all these like predictions and you have all this insight into the study of generational change and how things happen and why things happen, and then you can sort of look backwards and you'd be amazed at how shockingly predictive correct you can be when you start extrapolating forward. So that's sort of a good point as to where, where you've got all these slides of my childhood up there. Like, what was what was the moment? What's the significance of sort of Disney well, Why I and would show these in a, in a yeah. presentation. So this happened actually happened in a room like this at a, at a space conference, believe it or not, where I was talking at. Uh, and I, I grew up in Central Florida. My uncle worked for NASA. My dad's a doctor. When he started his career in Florida, he was the youngest private practice OBGYN in the state. When he retired, he was the oldest private practice OBGYN in the whole state, which is an interesting story. So we moved from Brooklyn and this little Jewish kid get migrated down to Florida, and we moved to Florida, Central Florida, and in the early 70s, Florida was a fairly kind of racist, backwards place, and full parts of it actually are, so a lot of it hasn't changed. Uh, but a lot of it has changed quite dramatically, and the place I grew up in, was called Orlando, Florida. But I, the, the first like year and a half was pre-Disney. So my initial lens was this is kind of a scary place for a little kid from someplace else. And then 1971, I guess it was, this sort of fantastical new place opened that had the ethics and the DNA of openness, and creativity, and willingness to explore and willingness to change. And it just sort of happened to open up in my backyard. So as a little kid, I got exposed to one version of something and then almost instantly another version, I was really little. And I noticed that it was just very formative to me. So before a talk like this once years ago, um, I just was out on stage early and they, were, they couldn't get the AV right, so it was like a whole big drama. So I was just, well, let's just do some questions while we started and someone asked that question, like, what, what, like, how did you kind of get to this place you are? And I sort of said, I think it's because I grew up in this crazy place that I lovingly now refer to as the funnel of crazy, which is Florida. I mean, Texas is kind of, you know, a, a sort of glob of crazy, right? But Florida is this little vestige that hangs at the bottom of the United States. And if things get crazy enough, they have to end up in Florida. That's just part <laughs> of the law of the United States, right? So I grew up in this crazy place where crazy things happened, and I just sort of managed to meld that into my sort of everyday existence, and then did TV production in Florida for years and years, and children's TV, and then ended up sort of building all these interesting products that people considered innovative and thoughtful, and that was sort of, you know, my, like the beginnings of my life, and I guess it turned out to be my career, which is odd. Well, it, exactly. Well, Does anybody even know what EPCOT stands for? Anybody? Anyone? Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. That was what Walt's vision was, <laughs> and it was not designed to be a theme park. Before he passed away, his goal was to actually make it a living community where people would live in the future. That was his goal. Uh, and then, of course, you know, commercial forces came in and they did their best. Uh, but you know, things like the Carousel of Progress and the People Mover and, and all these things uh, are, are things that have kind of happened now in reality, but started there. Right. Um, are this, these are different points that entertainment impacted me. So everything from um, obviously the Back to the Future films. You see some of the, you see Space Mountain in there. So Ted, we've I got some. Every, I have every one of those. <laughs> <things. Yeah. laughs> we we definitely we have the power of love. I had the power of love. Yeah. yeah. Hey Ted. <laughs> and we all had light bright, right? Did everybody? Did anybody here have light bright? Yeah. Something about the creativity of just playing around with light, right? Light. Fantastic. 
colors, pegs, you can make whatever. Um, and then the other one here is um, video art. And I don't like that's never uh, have yeah. heard of it, but it was a, it was actually a console version of paint. So. Well, and it's funny in the in the lower I guess left corner to me you have. Uh, uh, Mark Summers, who I worked with a lot in Orlando. I worked on all those double dare shows when I was a much younger version of myself. So. Well, I have to tell you, like that was a dream. I would watch the show, and I'm like, gosh, I, I want to be on the show. I want to be on the show. I meet, I meet so many people in different shows that are, you know, so I'm in my late 50s. I meet people that are in their 30s, 40s now, and they could care less about all the other stuff I did. But when I say, oh yeah, I worked on like Double Dare, and what would you do, and welcome freshman, and they're like, what? You know, that's that's their lens of like that was that was that what they grew up on. They're like, well, worked on that stuff, yeah. And and even yesterday, when when you and I were hanging out, there was um, there was the that nice. Uh, woman we met and that's exactly what she said. She's like, oh my gosh, Mark Summers, my childhood. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was fun. <laughs> um, Does anybody remember the, the, the TV game show Remote Control on MTV? Anybody remember that? Just a few of you. Wow, I guess we are <laughs> getting old. Uh, you can look it up. It was kind of a very iconic game show that I worked on in MTV. It was back, back in the day. It's great. So, well, we, we didn't have a lot of access to like, we d I didn't have Disney in my backyard. <laughs> but what I did have was access to like local arcades. Um, you can see, a, I don't know if you guys even know what Vetrex is. It was an, an early sort of carry along uh, console. It was my dad did and play it. And then he was like, oh, you wanna play this? Great. Um, and uh, it, was, it was pure delight playing that game. You can see it's not very sophisticated. Uh, but the big moment for me is when I got my NES. So, uh, Christmas came, I got my first NES, and I basically lived in NES land in my room, uh, as probably a lot of kids did. Um, but really, that connection of video games, techie toys, and light bright, not sophisticated, but definitely creative. Right, so to your point about your fervor and the dynamic excitement you had about your NES and the games you would play, it's not really all that hard to extrapolate the success of Roblox, right? It's It's kind of, all the same stuff, just through a different lens and a different form of technology and technology advancement. But humans sort of like to do the same things generation to generation. We just change the, the shell, we change the form factor. Social gaming was, um, you came over to yeah, your friend's house, the living room and, hang out. Yeah. and you had, uh, if you had a two-player game, two of you could play and the other one would be in the background sort of looking at the book, like how do I get to the next level, um, or combing through sort of the um, any, uh, Nintendo Power magazine <laughs> um, to find out. And that was social gaming, and I think that's what's really cool now about the likes of Roblox, about the likes of Fortnite, that um, it's, it is that social connection. You don't have to leave your house. Um, that's where kids go to meet up, hang out, explore, build, create, and be entertained, right? Now we're gonna get back in our time machine of choice and get to right now um, and talk about um, what it's like pioneering the future. So as Ted mentioned, we both have similar roles in terms of being explored, bringing sort of what's new and next into um, our organizations and helping create new products or services. Um, and we're gonna kind of go a little behind the curtain now and share some stories, um, you know, other than just a great idea, because ideas will only get you so far as we know. Um, but I think these principles are really important, whether, uh, whether you're a startup, you're a creator, you're working in a big company and your, your role is, you know, pioneering or innovating in the company. Uh, but we think about things alignment, right? So if you have like a, a co-creator you're working with, a team you're working with, just, you know, simply making sure everybody's on the same page, right? It's obvious to a lot of you if you're doing anything entrepreneurial in your in your life or in your pursuits. But I think the, the two things that are the riding sort of driving principles are you gotta have guts, you gotta have balls of steel, and you, you have to not be afraid to fail. Like literally kind of in your core, even though outwardly your shell is, gosh, I really don't want to fail. Something inside you has to sort of say, it's okay to fail. And not a lot of people really have that in their inner core. They might tell you they do, but the ones that really, really succeed at it, somehow, you know, these days we talk about the spectrum, right? Yeah. And we were joking with some friends last night. Well. If it's a spectrum, we're all on the spectrum because it's a spectrum, <laughs> right? 
And those that have this kind of part of the <laughs> spectrum, which whatever, whatever their brain chemistry allows them to do and be and their risk tolerance somehow is just more tuned up or stronger or harder than others. And even with that, you know, most people never get to the other side, right? Most people never get to the success quotient of entrepreneurial, statistically. But the willingness to try, I think, has a lot to do with brain chemistry. Um, at least when I, you know, the people I surround myself with and the people that I admire from a risk-taking standpoint, they're certainly not perfect people. They have lots of foibles, right? Uh, but they manage to accomplish things, and that is kind of an interesting, at least for me, an interesting perspective on uh, what we're talking about and where, where things go and why you why certain people create and certain people are wanting to create but are afraid to create. Like, you have to be able to yeah, take that. Yeah, but that's, that, that's like just a phrase, right? It's like, the words are the words, but if you really believe it, then, you can accomplish stuff, like people accomplish things, and still to this day accomplish remarkable things that we're able to create visually. And as a kid, that's complete science fiction. Like the, the, the fidelity of what we're seeing so far away, you know, from a light year perspective, I don't know. Do you guys, are you guys in awe of it as much as I am? Because I'm just completely in awe of it, right? Okay. Got a little, a little clap for the James Webb telescope, I'm just kidding. That companies are starting to be more open. You know, I think like back in the day, it was like you had to go to this particular university or you had to have this particular trade. And now, because we we can connect with anyone anywhere in the world, and people can, they're um, they're creators. They learn a, a skill. They're really awesome at what they do, and they may not have the piece of paper behind it, but they've got a portfolio and they've got they've got skills. And I think it's important just um, for everyone. Well, so on top of everything else. Like, you're gonna get knocked down a lot when you try and do something new, and that's an interesting piece of the puzzle, too. It, it is not, it is not easy. And actually, when you and I had our chat uh, last week, we were talking and yeah, as well, and uh, one of the I, I appreciated about the conversation is, um, so I have a closet, I live in a, I live in a fair, like, small house. Uh, I have a closet that is stacked with loads of um, products that went to market, failed, um, my yeah, wall of failure. I have a good wall of failure too. Yeah. And um, and in there, and my husband keeps pushing me, like, okay, can we get rid of this stuff? I'm like, no. It's 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 like my learning library. It's it's references. Everyone, um, it it's resilience. It's learning. So tell them a little about your your um, library of learning or whatever you call well, it. Well, what you're doing, and I think in today's world, especially with the levels of, of technological accessibility that we have, um, people forget the why stage and they sort of move into the profiteering stage a little too fast. Um, so I think if I talk to people that are building new products and new things into my job, I, I one of the, the ways I describe my sort of role in, in the world of work is I'm a professional frog kisser because you got to kiss a lot of frogs to find your prince or your princess. <laughs> and a lot of what I do is I ask, why are you building this? Why are you moving down this road? And a lot of people don't have a, a strong enough answer to get me excited about why they're doing it. And I, and I think a lot of things that relate to this broad term now that maybe a lot of you are pursuing in some fashion that we, we call the metaverse, I, I've just shrunken it down to the MV. I refuse to call it the metaverse anymore because it's already fully jumped the shark, so it's like, well, just shrink it down to MV. Um, so in the world of the MV, uh, MV, I talk to a lot of people that have all these ideas and pursuits that they're doing, and when I really start to ask them, why are you doing this? What's the reason you want to do this? They often don't have a good enough answer, uh, and that frustrates me. I don't know if that frustrates you about new things, too, sometimes, at least in this lens. Maybe it's just my age showing up a little bit, but I want the why to be stronger. No, I, I, whenever we're coming up with something, I'm like, that's the question I ask is, what problem are we solving? Like, how is this making anything, any of the errors better, yeah. faster? Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, cool. And then just I don't like, know if you guys all realize it would be so philosophical this morning when you came here. <laughs> Hopefully this is kind of what you want to talk about. So, uh, entrepreneurship. So that's a lot of what you and I do, right? It's so being that internal um, entrepreneur and asking the why and trying to find out um, what's next. So now, 
the, the first, so I, I migrated out of the, the mostly children's production world into building tools for creative people. And I got this great opportunity to work with a small little engineering firm uh, out of Northern California that you would have probably never heard of that worked with a larger firm that some of you have heard of called Apple. And um, I spent seven years helping them kind of cultivate this thing called desktop video, which at the time I was doing it was fairly primitive. It's continued to evolve and, and become more and more successful as a, as a use case because everybody's media device you carry in your pocket now does video uh, on a chipset. Right? In the early days when I was doing it, you couldn't put it on a chipset. You had to build it externally and plug it in with all kinds of special wires. Do not fit in your pocket. Yeah, and then I, and then myself, I kind of got involved in, in the startup world and I helped start a, a company. If any of you are in the media business or do editing or stuff on your computers in the media world, I started this little company with a partner of mine called GTech, which uh, we sold a few years later. It's still the most popular brand of uh, drives for multimedia purposes on the planet. So every time I go into an edit suite and I see them there, I'm like, yeah, I made those. Like, what do you mean you made those? I'm like, yeah, I made those. <laughs> what? Like, yeah. uh, and then um, a number of years later, uh, I got involved in the, in the camera imaging world uh, with a, a brilliant guy who founded a company, uh, and he, he it was from the, the sunglasses and apparel world, of all things, and I came from sort of the, the desktop video world, and the two of us went on this journey to create a new form of motion picture capture that would be logical and respectful to the art and science of film and not the burgeoning art and science of video. It was designed to be a digital motion picture camera, not a digital video camera. Um, and it started a revolution um, in the professional imaging, imaging world, of which there are now six or seven competitors, but RED is really sort of the originator of that form and style of cinematography tool. Um, and I was, the, I was the first employee of that company, so it was quite a roller coaster, as you might imagine, of building something. And you know, I mean, a demand for something from a professional use, and you know, it's not a consumer tool, at least it wasn't at the time. Um, the professional demand was so strong once we launched this thing. We launched it in 2006, so I guess it's not all that long ago in the past. Um, was so unbelievably powerful that we were almost forced to release this product before it was ready. And it did start a little bit of a weird trend, which sometimes I'm proud of and sometimes I'm embarrassed of, of products sort of entering the marketplace before they have the chance to mature and, and sort of clean up all the rough edges. Uh, and it really wasn't our desire to release it so hyper early. It was that once we took orders for this thing, people were like, we want it, we want it, we want it now, we're ready, we need it, we want it. And we were very overt in the first year or two of this product's life, saying it's very early. It is not particularly stable yet. It does amazing things. Like when you saw the quality of the, of the visuals on these gigantic screens, that's why people wanted it. But we, we forewarned them. You know, we said, this is not really, like this hasn't been around the planet for 30 years. And I said, please, like at the very beginning, don't use it on like professional products where like you, the stakes are high and you can't do reshoots and you just, they all agreed. And then, of course, instantly when we released it, they, none of them followed the rules. And then they, some of them would get mad. Some of them would be very respectful. They'd say, look, we knew, we, signed, we got what we signed up for, we get it. But the images are amazing. We're going to put up with all the challenges. And then there were other people that were like, it's not working. I'm like, well, I warned you. I told you it was not going to do this. Maybe the best story is some of the early, early adopters of this camera. Um, it, was, it was kind of an interesting kind of group of heavy hitters that were very, very interested in, in the new and, and wanted to move off celluloid into digital. But, didn't want to shoot on little teeny sensor cameras that looked like video. They wanted it to still look like film, um, or at least have the aesthetic of film. Uh, so one of them was Peter Jackson, and one was David Fincher, and one was Steven Soderbergh, and there were a few others. But Steven Soderbergh did one of the very, very first feature films with these red cameras. And very distinctly remember spending a lot of time with him and kind of walking through, you know, what it's going to be like shooting with these things. And it, and function and you know the way you use it will be just like a film camera but there may be concerns and stuff and now he's like oh yeah we're gonna go in Puerto Rico deep in the jungle with him and I'm like well you know you might want to have some film cameras on the truck just in case because you know these things are still fairly prototype right he's taking them out he's like no no we're not doing that I was like what do you mean he says the minute I put a film camera on the truck when this thing goes down what's gonna happen is my producers are gonna start to make me shoot on the film camera and I don't want that to happen. 
So I'm gonna remove that from the equation, meaning you have to figure out how to make this work. And I understand that sometimes it's not gonna work, but I want an engineer with me on site, in the jungle, to fix stuff, kind of MacGyver style, and that's what we did. And lo and behold, it worked, and he was able to get the feature out and do it completely digital end to end, and that started an interesting trend. So, you know, in addition to the entrepreneurs needing to absorb and take some risk, the end users also have to absorb and take some risk. But if you're in the right headspace and mind space to say, I want this to work, I'm going to force it into the existence of working. And I will put up with whatever risk dynamics come along the way, I'm good with it. And I, I still you know, kind of hold a very sweet spot in my heart for that because without that step, maybe we wouldn't have gotten as far as, as we've gotten. And maybe all the competitors that came later and sort of saw what we were doing and built other things that were likely more stable just because they came later, probably would have had that chance if we didn't push that envelope and maybe we'd be in a, a different place in terms of high-res imaging today. So, you know, there's a certain degree of, of sort of group pride of that, of that group. When you were creating the red cam, right, the, the notion of beta testing or, oh, it may or may not work, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't common. Well, for, certainly for a plug, maybe a little faster than it should have. And we all kind of learned how to do this, and I think other product categories have, have gotten, and I think the consumer base has gotten more attuned to that. It's like, I'm signing up for this ride if I want to be an early adopter. I mean, I do a I lot in virtual reality. <laughs> yeah, these days, I mean, I yeah. explore a lot in virtual reality and mixed reality, and I live this every day in my life. Like, you know, there are people demoing things with, to me that are not in the public eye in any way, shape, or form yet, and they're always breaking. And, you know, I'm the most, I'm the easiest person to demo in the world. Cause like they're all nervous and like, oh, it worked yesterday. It's I'm like, this is totally fine. It's fully expected. I'm with you. I believe in you and we're gonna stick with it. Don't, you know, just calm down. It's all gonna be okay. See those early prototypes. Uh, and, and my son kind of has grown up testing these toys and some of them are like, I, I don't know about this, but. Uh, but <laughs> right. So it's an interesting life, right? Yeah, um, having that. That feedback, and I love I love the story that you just said a moment ago too, because um, the idea of taking the, the the film camera, the proper camera, like taking that tool away, and just having to focus on using the red cam and working it out no matter what. I think like that is a huge plus, and to have like a kind of partner and collaborator to to work lot, like that. Of, do any of you shoot high resolution imagery today, both still or? video and, and you're on that ride still to this day. And it's an interesting ride, right? We've learned a lot about this in the last 20 years and there's more, way more to come. We're, we're deep in Winnie K resolution experiments now. So, you know, today's modern sort of very pedestrian cameras can shoot 8K with a very low price point, right? Uh, and, but that's not the end of the journey by any stretch of the imagination. There are things we're experimenting with in extraordinary exotic imaging that are pushing that envelope way further and gigantic displays and gigantic display environments that I'm involved in that are, even for me are just mind blowing what is happening in the, in the world of imaging and, and imaging display right now. Probably have ultra high res displays now, right? I mean, 4K displays are very commonplace. You buy them at Costco and Walmart. It's not, you know, but 10 years ago, those were super exotic. So that's some of that past is futurist stuff is you kind of look at like, oh yeah, I remember my, you know, my first sort of flat screen display was a pioneer and it was $25,000 for a you know, 46 inch television that was 720p resolution. And it was mind blowingly good then. Um, and now you know, we can buy a, a $400 TV that is the size of a wall and, and is 4K. But 8K used to be extraordinarily exotic and now you can buy those as consumer devices. Um, and a lot of this gets into this really interesting discussion about how far you sit from it and where it's going and you know, the kind of resolution we use on screens like this. Um, but if you want to get really out to, the, to the, the far edges of this stuff, and I did some consulting with this group uh, at the beginning of their journey, um, there's this thing in Vegas called the MSG Sphere. I don't know if any of you have kept track of that. Uh, well, the outside is wild, and not many people have seen the inside of it, but I'm one of the folks that's seen the inside of this thing, and it's even wilder. It is the largest physical high-res display in the world, at least today, uh, and they're gonna open it you know, this fall. So it's going to be crazy um, what you can do with this thing in the right hand. So, you know, these are things we're keeping a close eye on. It's always a moving scale. Cool. Yeah, now and next. So, um, we, we, we went to the past. 
we talked about like grit and gumption and resilience. Um, and now and next, so really jumping into interactive storytelling, XR, AI, and sensory. Sensory is like this a This is all stuff you and I are, are, are making our living at today, right? So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. at the root, at the root, if we had to summarize it, that's it. Yeah, and it's really all I've done for a long time now is explore things that are not mature yet, that are finding their way into the world. And I, and I, I often say, you know, you can't do everything. Right? So if, you're, if your tool and trade and your skill base is to be really comfortable with things that are sort of early in their curve, then once it sort of gets to a certain point, go ahead and leave that to others. Let them mature it. Your job is not to, to grow it up into a full grown-up. Your job is to get it from infancy through the toddler stage. That tends to be my but job. As we know, like there's timing, right? Like timing or cost or all those different indicators. Um, and like you all get really excited, I'm like, okay, cool, and here's where we can we can see those opportunities and map the opportunities, and then, you know, come, what, three three years later, five years later, it's commonplace, I'm like, oh, are, are we talking about that again? <laughs> yeah, I, I think the stuff I work on is so early on that I'm always saying to people, you know, lower your expectations on the timing. Things take way longer to enter into the consumer realm and truly, you know, grasp hold than you think. And really almost the bare minimum timing is 10 years from when a product or a product category starts and starts to come into life and come into existence to really find its even beginnings of maturity. Um, at least that's what I've discovered over doing this now for long enough that I kind of have like a track record on it and I could go, yeah, about 10 years. Yeah, about 12 to 15 years. Yeah, it's like two to three years now. And, and when people have the illusion that things are happening in two to three years, they actually forget all the underpinnings of the things that happen well before it to kind of get it to the stage where people instantly think it's happening. Um, and that's kind of where we're living now with kind of this nomenclature of Web3 and MV and all this stuff is everybody kind of thinks it's like all happening so fast. I'm like, did you really forget about the last 40 years of what we used to call the World Wide Web and cyberspace and the information superhighway? Because all we're doing is just evolving that tool set and turning it into things that will allow us to use the pipes that have grown throughout the world and still much of the world doesn't have these pipes so it's a bit of a pipe dream for a lot of the planet Earth. Um, but in, in dense places like Austin, Texas, or California where I live, or parts of Florida, or you know, dense, wide, uh, high resolution graphics and, and things that start to feel real to us, right? Start to create simulation dynamics to us uh, over those pipes, so. Well, and using your nomenclature of MV. Yes, um, <laughs> good, it's good, taking on. Which is good. About, you know, internet, World Wide Web, I mean, it's the same thing when we think about MV, right? Like, how how long have social and collaborative games been going on? I mean, well, it's I mean, decades just, like, now. For, all, for, for those of you that may look a little like me, you know, maybe you remember this thing that used to be called America Online, and then they shrunk that to AOL. So I'm on the right track, maybe. Um, and they had these things called AOL chat rooms. And, you know, those were a thing. Now they were sort of primitive graphically to what we do today, but it's the same human behavior that we see again popping up over and over and over again. So anytime people think something is wholly new, it's pretty easy to point out that none of these things are really new. They're just the evolutions. To everybody had it on their device. Yeah, and I still think that's a fairly restrictive form factor for augmented and mixed reality, right? I think it's a step in the right direction. And when you hear a guy like a Tim Cook who runs Apple say things like, you know, augmented reality, and mixed reality will be that thing that at some point in the future, you will kind of not even understand how you live without it. Just like today's world of a smartphone, um, and I've given many talks about this dynamic of like, a smartphone is no longer technology. A smartphone is part of your bio. How often you hold it, touch it, connect with it, use it, it's happening right now. There's people multitasking on their biological devices, and that is not, technology anymore. It is actually embedded in your physical and mental DNA, right? Whether you want to admit it or not, it's 100% happened to you. But we're still using a form factor from generations ago. Uh, it should feel like a little box 
You know, like I used to show this image of, remember, did anybody live long enough in Apple sort of nomenclature to remember the, the, the Mac SE, the little cute little box with the screen? If you take your iPhone today and hold it up against a Mac SE and look at the screen, just the screen size and how it works, it's remarkably close. <laughs> like 40 years later, you know, we hold our Mac SE, basically. Um, but a thing I, I guess, maybe one of those professing, but involved in for quite a number of years now, is the belief structure that those devices are sort of magic windows to the world, and the next devices that we will get over time, and again, look at companies like uh, what we lovingly refer to as the artist formerly known as Facebook. You know, they're, they're putting a, a bunch of money into these things that still look like boxes on your face, and they're evolving it and evolving it and putting huge amounts of capital and resources in it. Um, to, to see if they can get to this kind of you know, rainbow at the, the end of the, the, the gold at the end of the rainbow, so to speak. Um, uh, but technology has gotten to a point where we're starting to learn and remember where our eyes are and where our ears are, and they're not in our hands, right? Um, so if we get to a point where it makes more sense to wear it than hold it, a lot of you that thinks, oh no, well, this is the device I'm going to use, like this is the device I'm gonna use forever, will not be using that device anymore. And all we can do is use our past as reference and remember the day that a lot of us used to work on computers that were these giant CRT screen things that you had to put on a desk and you know, and then we kind of evolved that and evolved that and evolved that and now we have very low cost, high mobility laptops and tablets and these things called phones, which you really shouldn't even call phones anymore, they're just pocket computers, right? Um, so this goes back to that guts and gumption thing, extraordinarily hard to do what we're trying to do, to get it right, to get the, the fit and finish right, to really make it something you're gonna want aspirationally instead of the device you have today, um, is a really hard challenge. Um, and the human dynamics of understanding how we're gonna evolve, evolve that biological tool set what we now call a smartphone, into some kind of wearable thing, you know, whether it's glasses or implants or whatever we all end up using, but it's gonna be closer to our eyes and that digital landscape that we all sort of hold in our hands and is this big and we kind of hold it up and look around when we wanna do the AR version, that's the little kind of magic window version, that magic window will explode. So in the fairly near future, I could be wearing glasses that just look like glasses. Today, we test things that almost look like glasses. And if I wanted to turn every single one of you into a giant dragon, I could. And it wouldn't be just in my phone like this. It would look real to me, right? And this goes all the way back. It's kind of this is, so it's like, like a comedian doing the callback, right? This goes all the way back to that first part of our discussion when you talked about Disney. Because a big part of the idea of simulation experiences in theme parks early, early on is a big part of my formative years and my formative understanding of what entertainment can be and will be well beyond a traditional screen, well beyond a screen that looks like this, that we know where it starts and we know where it ends, right? In theme parks, if it's done correctly, you don't know where it starts and where it ends. It's just this joyous, amazing experience and it's everywhere around you. And now we're able to do that with technology and we sort of bring that home, which is the beginnings of home VR, which is working and starting to be profitable and starting to be a, a viable part of our industry, both professionally and, and personally, uh, you know, for indus industry and, and home fund use, like your NES, you know, the NES of the future. Um, but it's just like we're just getting started with this, this sort of use case and, and where it's all headed. So I, I would say you should be very optimistic about where it's going. A lot of companies are putting a lot of money and a lot of resources against it moving from the smartphone age to what comes after the, the smartphone. The thing, and it's, there's no the thing because in terms of a single device, right? Because we, as people, you know, move, interact differently in the world. Like VR, nobody needs to be living in VR. I love VR, I love VR gaming, I love exploring. Um, like when you're talking about 3D design of a physical product and getting people collaborating around that, cool. You know, when you think about AR and you want to have some um, gameplay experiences or turn people into dragons, right? Um, you can do that. And I do think there is, um, it's gonna be interesting to see where glasses go. Uh, we saw like there was um, the, the Ray-Ban ones were away, um, Snap yeah. many years ago, we're doing some experimenting. Just in the last 10 years, again, using that 10 year lens, we've seen things that were sort of on the edge of impossible to starting to enter into the age of possible now. 
the optics are starting to exhibit are starting to get good. And and the really big players, the, the one I've mentioned you know a few times today, I haven't really even entered the market yet, right? They're they're watching and learning and keeping a very close eye on the mistakes that have been made so far in the process of learning and seeing if they can learn from those mistakes. So I think you're gonna see the next three to five years is gonna be a very interesting time for all of us as we evolve as our technological human selves. It's gonna be a pretty interesting time. They're based here in Texas. Um, and actually it's probably about seven years ago or so when they had created the Merge goggles and they could also be not for VR, but also AR. Um, and mobile, so you just slide in your mobile phone uh, and it was accessible there. And so I really enjoyed um, working with them and their philosophy in terms of accessibility. Now, everybody, all consumers weren't ready for that yet. Um, and I think that's really key. Like you're saying, in the next couple of years, we're going to see that. And so there's a lot of great experimentation with multiple companies in terms of um, glasses and sound, the sound being embedded in there. I haven't quite got to that um, mass scale or affordability, but I think it's I think it's going to be coming soon. Um, and then some of the other things that you know we're hearing a lot about are um, wearables. They, it seems like wearables keep coming in and out yeah. of fashion. So what any takes on wearables? Well, like I said, I think this is all part and parcel to the idea. where where the biology works. I mean, again, if you if you look at the, the different companies, I guess we'll call it Apple again because they've had remarkable success with mm -hmm. the ear part of it, right? If you look at how many attempts at the various kind of forms of earbuds and various Bluetooth headsets and all these crazy form factors over the years, and ears is much easier than eyes, right? It's a simpler sort of use case. And But it still took a really long time to get the ergonomics where they were kind of fashion correct, fashion forward, felt like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Like we often joke about, the, the still you'll sometimes see people that wear kind of these weird Bluetooth headsets that have the weird microphones that kind of hang down to here from about 20 years ago. Um, and like I used to joke, because you know, I work for the company that makes Star Trek, right? It's like the last person that looked cool wearing something like that was Lieutenant Ohura, right? And after that, it was like, why are you wearing that stupid thing in your ear? But these days, the ethics of the AirPods, it's, it's like that's completely acceptable to the point where there's some stuff we're doing on with our CBS Sports folks where uh, on the PGA Tour, I don't know if any of you are golfers would like to watch golf on TV, we did this kind of inside the rope stuff with CBS now. And the golfer, while they're playing the sport, which is one of the few sports you can actually do this with, yeah. right? Um, they'll go on, on the hole while he's actually in competition and give him an AirPod, an AirPod, AirPod, stick it in his ear, and he's now communicating with all the, the sportscasters and he's talking about all the shots he's doing while he's doing it. And no one is like, oh God, why are they making that coffee wear that weird contraption? It's just like an AirPod. He puts it in and it totally works. So there's a there's a cultural sort of societal thing that happens with technology when, for whatever reason, how many times and how many sort of cycles it takes to kind of get it right for the human equation. And Apple tends to be pretty good at that. Other companies tend to be good at it too, but Apple tends to sort of excel at it. Wow. Um, it's coming. Right? Today we put these things on, they're clunky and goofy, but the experiences are remarkable that we can do with them. But it's not like you're gonna just wear these things on the street. It's even the most refined ones are not street wearable yet, right? Um, the ones that have visual tool set in them, right? Uh, but trust me, it's coming. I'm seeing them. It's what the coolest part of my job is I get to see things way, way before they actually have consumer viability. Uh, so I can tell you that it's coming. Get ready. Because in South by Southwest, somewhere in the future, we're all gonna have something different than we have today to communicate with, to connect with, to socialize with, to have fun with. And the remarkable experiments that a lot of these young entrepreneurs and these gigantic companies are doing are leading us down that path. Some of you in this room may be doing it right now. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm seeing all kinds of interesting stuff on the... Uh, I'm making up words to see in, in, in MV growth. Right? We'll need to edit this to say. Does anybody maybe. buy that? Does anybody believe that? Um, I guess if, we, if I take it out of the lens of the MV and just call it the continuation of the internet, mm -hmm. I would tend to believe that. I would say, I know that is multi trillion dollars per year as a worldwide revenue dynamic. So if we remove the nomenclature mm -hmm. and set that aside 
and say the evolution of technology and how we use it is likely multi-trillion dollar opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would agree. Yeah, location based. We actually didn't touch on, well, talk about Disney, but like in terms of location based yeah, sure. entertainment, you know, we're seeing a ton of growth there, right? Uh, we're looking at uh, brand and licensing market, an area that you live closely yep, in. Yep. <laughs> um, a ton of growth there. And then haptics as well. We didn't really touch on haptics yet, but uh, but a lot going on with haptics there. And then of course, you know, AR continuing to, to grow. And that's AR market overall, not necessarily like by device. So right, so these are real numbers, right? Significant numbers right. because it's very sort of segmented, but it's really important because Location-based entertainment tends to be the precursor to home entertainment. And again, using our pastest lens, the arcade yep. is what became home video entertainment, which is a much, much bigger business than arcades. But if you didn't have the arcade step, you don't have the home video step. You don't have Grand Theft Auto, right? And if you don't have the Nintendo Wii, you don't have virtual reality. People are like, what? what? This is a really interesting one for maybe for those of you that want to go back in time a little bit. Did anybody ever play the So did you think you were playing a video game? You were actually doing a home simulation experiment for our friends at Nintendo. Because if you remember what the Nintendo Wii was, you weren't sitting on your couch doing this, you know, like a video game. You were bowling in your living room. You were playing tennis in your living room. You, you know, grandma was bowling in the living room, and that was amazing. Yes. Because that was a simulation. It was something you could only do in a theme park up until our friends in Japan and Nintendo were like, you know what? We can make a different kind of game. We can use this controller to simulate That's right. a behavioral use case. And the reason why we knew, those of us that were deep in this, that it was a full-on simulation was in the early days of the Nintendo Wii. Who remembers this story? I'll, I'll start the story and you can probably finish it. Um, you had your controllers and you would get so into the thing, tennis, boxing, whatever it was, and there was no safety strap in the very first generation of the Nintendo Wii. Nor did they have the little rubber condom on it to protect the thing, it was hard plastic. The people would get so into it that they would whip their controller into their TV and break their TV. And it happened a lot, to the point where Nintendo was like, we better put some straps on these things. And even more important, we better put some like rubber gaskets on them that we could sell as an accessory. Because people are hurting themselves. Because not only was it going into their TV, it was going into their friend's face when they were swinging, right? Um, I have this, I don't know if you have that visual, but I have, you can find it online. I have this really interesting launch video of the Nintendo Wii to the launch video of the Quest, which is um, the first real consumer uh, level of VR device at scale from, from now Meta, it used to be Facebook, it used to be Oculus. Um, it's the same video, like you're looking at the same stuff. It's just the display changed. It's now fully immersive. You wear it instead of sticking on your wall, but the behavioral cues are exactly the same. And when we play VR games, all we're doing is playing modern Wii games. So the Nintendo does not get enough credit for starting that revolution. Everybody thinks it started with Facebook and Oculus. It did not. It started with Walt Disney and, and Nintendo. That's my, that's my thesis. Well, I love play. Like a lot of the stuff Ted and I are talking about today, there's loads of great companies out there who are demoing stuff and you can kind of whiz around and experiment with some of the, the early stuff and some of the stuff that's in market now. But uh, a couple of the things we're doing over at Dentsu, um, one, we actually recently announced our Dentsu Next Space, and um, it is an MD experience uh, in collaboration with uh, Microsoft, LinkedIn, and Head Office Space. Uh, and it's all about kind of uh, co-creating what's next. So getting from a, mainly from like a B2B play of things like working with companies to create virtual test labs. Um, helping companies save a ton of money on that and being more inclusive. Um, a couple of I'm curious from the Western world, do, do, any, do, do people know Dentsu out here? Dentsu is a huge corporation yeah. um, in Japan, Japan based, but it's, it, it's it, like Corporation, you know, Paramount Global, but Dentsu is way bigger than what we are. And they have all these different sort of work veins and stuff. It's a really interesting company. Um, and it's exciting to see that they're kind of leaning into uh, this innovation curve and not afraid to sort of experiment with this stuff because probably a lot of this, I would say that these things are not their revenue drivers right now. Um, so it's great that they're taking these risks and seeing if it will become a revenue driver somewhere in the future. I think that's And as we touched on earlier, it's like you have, to, you have to have those swings. You have to experiment. I think one of the things um, for me kind of uh, personally that's important to me is you, know, you hear a lot of different companies out there talking 
about the space, but like, you know, who's actually out there experimenting in the space, you know, having those um, at-bats, right? And, and taking it and having the failures, having the learnings and bringing real products to market. Um, and so that's what, that is what's exciting about being in a company like Dentsu. The, um, actually in the Creative Expo there, we have one of our uh, items here called Hug Ticks. So instead of haptics. Hug tick, hug, hug. Hug ticks, okay, exactly, and so um, it's the idea of you know how you can how people can feel good and better with hugs, um, and you can actually go check that out. So um, you'll be able to do a remote hug with somebody in, in Japan. Exactly, yes. dance, right? So like those sensory experiences, dance um, is based on sense, um, and really applying a bunch of different uh, technologies there. And then the other one here, uh, wow. it's that's like a, a snack. Uh, experimentation that we're doing. So you don't actually eat food, but it mimics the sound. We were talking about sound yeah. and behavior of food. So that's like a modern Tamagotchi type of a thing? You gotta feed it to keep it alive? Or what's the point? No, of this is like the oh, okay. sound. So it's a, it's a sensory experience. Exactly. And so if you want like potato chips or candy, uh, they have a salad option, you know, to keep it. And hear what salad sounds like? Exactly. Eat. So touching all the different um, sounds and sensory experiences. Um, so yeah, just wanted to share a little bit about a little well, I'll bit. I mentioned about... because you know on my little micro version of my iPhone, which I know a lot of you have, um, and it's, it's every Friday uh, uh, with our, our third partner in crime is uh, a guy named Roni Abovitz, who used to be the uh, CEO and he's the founder of Magic Leap. So the three of us get into all this stuff uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, the show gets posted sometime Friday afternoon every week, and we talk about all kind of interesting stuff. This past week we had Blake who runs uh, the interactive XR stuff of all South By, so if you haven't had a chance to go up to the, I think it's at the Fairmont this year, not the Hilton, um, go up and see that. There's a lot of emerging tech there, um, and if you want to listen to our show, it's called This Week in XR, which is something I do in addition to my day job at Paramount, so yeah, definitely. I'll call that out. Definitely a good show. You guys know I'm, I always like the topics listener. they have. I'm a listener. <laughs> Real next innovation, I believe, is volumetric capture. Is mm. as we start to move away from traditional screens that have 2D pixel grids, like the screens you're looking at of us, the giant size there, um, and we start to have wearable glasses that have actually real volume in them as a tool set, we need a different form of capture. We cannot, and, and 3D is an illusion of that, but it's only on one plane. Volumetric capture, which I'm involved in a number of different uh, companies, a startup I'm an investor in called Volygon and a, a few other things. Um, there's a lot of companies doing this. Microsoft was doing this for a long time. It's very early stage, right? Uh, but it's an important <clears throat> next step in what cameras will do is capture volume as well as high fidelity so that we can use them in the devices of tomorrow. I think that's a problem that popular entertainment sort of solves. I don't know if it solves it, but it, it helps people uh, find enjoyment in their lives. It, it's a lens to like, you know, it's aspirational lens, it's a creative lens, it's a it's an excitement lens. Um, in another session someday, we could talk about how the technology of everything on demand has changed the entertainment spectrum. That's a big deal. That's a big question. Um, Culture, kind of we were talking about inspiration. Yeah, sure. Um, collaboration and also um, how entertainment touches all different technology and pieces and carrying those stories and being able to do that with you know friends, family, and having those shared experiences. Right. Well, and as the last one, as people are trickling on to the next thing, uh, is they're both just nomenclatures, right? To me, there is no web one, web two, web three, really. We just, as humans, have to give them definitions. So there is not like a hard stop of web two where we live today into web three. It's just a transition over time to things getting more evolved. Um, but Web3 is the underpinnings, the important underpinnings of what the MV will live on top of. So it's actually the more important infrastructure. It's, it's you know, the, the things that like in the traditional web dynamics we call HTML or hyperlinks or hypertext. Um, that's what the Web3, and then there's the, the whole economic component with crypto and blockchain, which we didn't have time to get into yeah, today, but, you know, <laughs> I'm not enough. For joining us, Thank please. You. <laughs>